Hi, this is Sabal Edmonds with Newsbud. And this is Spiro with Newsbud. Well, today we are going to start with two updates on Ahmed Chatayev and in relation to Istanbul airport attacks. And uh, we are following this story. It's not a one-time coverage. We've already had two episodes on Istanbul airport attacks uh, by posing the questions that nobody else in the mainstream media seems to be posing. I'm going to go ahead and uh, talk about the first one that came out about uh, two days ago through Russia Today, RT. At least that was the first time I saw it. And it's talking about the Chechen leader naming wanted terrorists hiding in Turkey and demanding handover. Ramzan Kadyrov is the leader of the Chechen Republic, and he is accusing Turkey and Georgia and Austria as complicit parties in this Istanbul terror attack if their claim is true that Ahmed Chatayev was the mastermind. And in fact, I'm going to go ahead and read this really interesting uh, comment that he posted, this Chechen leader, Ramzan Kadyrov, on his Instagram page. And he writes uh, that when Chatayev left Chechnya, he was only an ordinary mobster. But after spending time in Austria, Georgia, and Turkey, NATO member, NATO member, and NATO ally, he became a super terrorist. It was with the support of these countries' special services, Ramzan says, that he raised, this is Chatayev, tremendous funds for worldwide infamous terrorist ringleader Hussein Gakayev, who has hundreds of lives weighing on his conscience. He also, and this is Kadyrov, notes that Chatayev's complicities in the Istanbul attack, if it is proved, okay, so far it's just claims, Western and Georgian special services should share the blame as well as other agencies that took part in the making of this terrorist. This is very, very interesting because as we know, uh, Chatayev is a Chechen and he is being uh, pointed as the leader, the mastermind of uh, Istanbul airport terror attack and possibly participating in, uh, in the Brussels airport attack. And another interesting point about this bureau is the fact that Russian FSB has been conducting and carrying out a bunch of assassinations inside Turkey taking out some of these top uh, Chechen terrorist organizers and operatives. In fact, I'm going to have the link with our intro, with our blurb for our viewers. Uh, we can name at least five cases of assassinations carried out by Russian FSB in Turkey and basically taking out some of these uh, top ringleaders for Chechen terrorist groups. And as you know, Turkey is the NATO member and for over two decades almost, they have been grooming and participating in training and arming these Chechen terrorists. And many of them are now being funneled through Turkey into Syria. So that's very, very interesting. And the fact that Chechen leader came out and, and put this very strongly out there is very interesting. And not only Chatayev, but he's naming, this is Kadyrov, Chechen leader, he's naming 13 other top Chechen terrorists, their names and last names, he's listing them, currently in Turkey, and he's asking Turkey to hand over these terrorists instead of harboring them. Well, Sabel, that is obviously uh, very interesting, uh, another development in the case, and we see this type of... Uh, activity quite often, especially with uh, you know, other countries and governments warning other countries of impending attacks. Um, according to RT, uh, Moscow has repeatedly warned Turkey and the EU that suspected terrorists are hiding in their territories, uh, but both Ankara and Brussels largely ignored the calls, according to the Kremlin. Now, we all know that RT is virtually the mouthpiece of the Kremlin, uh, but they were quoted uh, the Kremlin spokesman was quoted as saying, over the past uh, years, Russia has informed Turkey and the European colleagues that people suspected of having links to terrorism 
and people who are suspected of planning to join terrorist groups find shelter in both Turkey and in a number of European countries. So uh, the Kremlin also stated that they believe that this most recent attack that took place at the Istanbul airport uh, was a consequence of uh, such disregard of these warnings provided by the Kremlin. Well, that's right. And, and we have, let's go back to 2001. Let's go back to the Uber so-called terrorist attack here, 9-11. And this is just based on the documentation, based on the government's own admission here in the United States. Uh, these were the countries that uh, basically specifically warned the U.S. government, FBI, CIA, State Department, on impending terror attack in the United States, some of them even mentioning airplanes. And uh, to just name a few, we have uh, United Kingdom, we have France, we have Argentina, we have Afghanistan, we have Cayman Islands, we have Egypt, Germany, Israel, Italy, Jordan, Morocco, and Russia. So we got a few weeks before, the, starting actually two months before that 9-11 uh, so-called terror attack, we received specific intelligence from these nations giving warning about impending attack. And uh, an interesting one I came across firsthand directly while I was working in the FBI and this French uh, translator for the FBI's counterintelligence division towards the end of August, together with two FBI agents from the FBI's Washington field office, they got this emergency request from France to go and participate in this meeting that had to do about impending major terror attack in the United States, on the U.S. soil. So they traveled to France, they went to Paris, they met with the intelligence officials, they got the documents, and according to this translator, they were very specific about airplanes being used and the people from various countries about to being about to carry out an attack. Well, they came back, and that information ended up in some black hole, along with all these other countries that I named. So this trend of all these countries that become targets of the real terrorist attack before, just shortly before terror attacks, getting, receiving all these tips, information from countries with uber intelligence agencies like the United Kingdom, like Israel, uh, etc. So uh, as uh, we know, of course, the same thing happened with uh, Brussels attack in the airport. And uh, you can go ahead and talk about that. Again, we see the same exact pattern. Well, you're absolutely right. And Brussels was another prime example of this quote unquote failed uh, communication between intelligence agencies. It, that's where they like to place the blame anyways. Uh, the Belgian security services, for example, as well as other Western intelligence agencies had advanced and precise intelligence warnings regarding the terrorist attacks in Belgium. In fact, some of the security services say they knew with a high degree of certainty that the attacks were planned in the very near future for the airport as well as the subways. And then there's multiple uh, different examples. For example, the, another example, the NYPD had warned the Dutch authorities about the Brussels uh, terrorist brothers days before the attack. So we're not even getting, uh, not only getting uh, the information from these great super powerful intelligence agencies, but local police departments are also able to gather this information and share it, but uh, still unable to act on this intelligence. And uh, the attacks continue. Exactly. We see the same patterns. We receive intelligence weeks, days before terror attacks. That seems to be present, that element, with all these so-called major terror attacks. Another trend that we keep coming across is the suspects or the so-called terrorist suspects who are carrying out these attacks happen to be working with these government agencies, uh, being arrested and mysteriously released, being arrested and mysteriously released. So we are observing the same pattern here with Ahmed Chatayev, who has been arrested in Sweden, who has been arrested in Bulgaria, he's been in Ukraine, he's worked with the government uh, in Georgia as an informant, as an asset, 
And again, we observe the same trends with the so-called suspects in the Belgium airport attack. These people who've been arrested multiple times, been reported specifically by Turkey, etc., multiple times, and they have had some sorts of dealings, arrangements, and uh, working relationship with the these West Western or the target nations government agencies, and brings this whole thing together. And that brings us to this. Um, this really interesting point that they also do, what what they do, how they use, and this is the mainstream media serving the deep state, serving those interests that are served by these so-called terror attacks. A lot of it goes into perception management and, and creation of boogeyman. And we see that over and over. As we can see, the brand Al-Qaeda began dying three, four years ago. And so quickly... Thanks to the mainstream media, this major brand, ISIS, was established, and everything that happened that's happening around the world is blamed on ISIS. I mean, in five years, you can't even name a single mega corporation or a corporation that has been this successful. They have their own currency, they have their own federal reserve, they have their own central banks, they have bases all over the world, in every single continent, and they are responsible for every single terror incident, and they are responsible even, God knows, maybe for some natural disasters. We're going to start hearing about earthquakes, and was that ISIS that really caused it? But this perception management that mainstream media facilitates for the deep state is for the purpose. And, And the major purposes, of course, we get to see is perpetual wars, ISIS means we go to Syria. Uh, Al-Qaeda meant we went into Afghanistan and into Iraq. And uh, and basically, it, it is shown as the justification and reasons for these ongoing, never-ending, perpetual wars. Well, you're absolutely right, Sabel. Absolutely. Another aspect that these uh, false flag terror events or these uh, you know created, manufactured terror threats... Uh, another aspect that comes out of that is the police state. I mean, we've seen after 9-11, uh, Department of Homeland Security was formed. Mega, mega police state has been, in fact, here since. Uh, now, recently, Jean-Claude Juncker, which is a think tank, compiled a report stating that the EU should establish a European CIA inspired by none other than the U.S. Department of Homeland Security. Now, this has since been echoed by the EU's Home Affairs Commissioner and Belgium's Prime Minister. And they suggest that all these different intelligence agencies pool their resources together and form one giant mega agency. And of course, they cite the reasoning for this is the London 7-7 attacks, 9-11, Paris, Brussels. So you're absolutely right. Not only does the threat of terror, the manufactured threat of terror, promote perpetual wars, but it also promotes the ever-expanding police state. Yeah, it's ludicrous. You know, Interpol was not enough. It became Europol. And now from Europol is not enough. And let's have this mega agency modeled after. It's, it's supposed to be a combination of CIA and the FBI. Well, are they going to eliminate Europol? I don't think so. Then there's going to be the next excuse you're going to hear is, well, these agencies are not communicating with each other because this new FBI slash CIA version is not providing information to Europol and playing the games that they have been playing here in the United States as if the DIA and the CIA and the DEA and the FBI and all the local police and the state police was not enough. We had to get Department of Homeland Security, not for any kind of a temporary period, but indefinitely. And it has been bloating and getting bigger and getting bigger and getting bigger. And it's going to keep getting bigger. And we are going to have more agencies too. Another creation we've had with, uh, especially after 9-11, been all these czars. (laughs) I mean, intelligence czar and the law enforcement czar. And uh, that's exactly the trend that we see is global. Now it's being carried out in Europe, or at least that's the intention. And of course, ISIS gets to be the U useful brand to milk and to uh, basically justify 
all the elements that they have been dying to implement, with wars to benefit the military-industrial complex and the financial institutions and with the police state. And to, to let you know and to just show you how successful they are becoming, uh, I saw this yesterday. They did this survey, and it showed that 91% of EU citizens believe ISIS will pose the most significant major threat to Europe in next five years. So they conducted this poll and majority of the EU citizens, 91% believe Islamic State, ISIS, will pose a serious, the most important, the most significant threat to Europe over the next five years and that attacks like the ones in Belgium and in Paris are going to be repeated again and again. So that shows that they are winning. It's being effective. It's the mainstream media, not only here in the United States, all over Europe, the deep state's design, and we see the majority falling for it every time, as they did with Al-Qaeda. If you would have done the same survey, which they did, they did it on a daily basis, 95% of Americans believe the biggest threat to their life is Al-Qaeda. Well, what happened to Al-Qaeda? Okay, welcome ISIS. And uh, with it, unfortunately, the success of the mainstream media in implementing uh, the perception management, the perception goals, and of course, the ultimate goals of the deep state. And thanks to them, 91% of Europe, they are saying this is the case. And you know what that translates to, uh, Spiro? That means if they were to put it on the ballot, should we go and invade Syria? Do you believe this 91% is going to say no, any of them? Because first, they have to believe the biggest threat in their lives happens to be ISIS. Well, they are saying ISIS is headquartered in Syria, and that's where they are. That's their most concentration happens to be in Syria. So that translates into the consent, the public nodding in Europe and in the U.S. and saying, Come on, guys, go. Let's just invade the bastards and just get over with it. Let's just go ahead and nuke Syria. This is how they get the public to go along with atrocities, with perpetual wars, with the expansion of police state. And this is the exact reason we are here as Newsbud, trying as much as we can with your help to counter what they are doing. And again, for that, we have you to thank. To, and uh, we'll be back with you soon with another episode and we will keep at this topic of Istanbul airport attack and Chatayev because this is part of our investigative journalism.